Hi and welcome here on Pierusini.com, the wine show. And I'm, yeah, quite, um, yeah, let's say honored because I have a really special guest today here on my show um, from California, Chris Carpenter. Great to have you on my show. Really, it's a really, yeah, it's an honor for me. Well, thank you, thank you. It's an honor to be here. Yeah, um, I hope you are fine. You, you now, you, you came here and when did you arrive in Germany? Yeah. Arrived in Germany yesterday. Yesterday. Yeah, from France. Okay, so you're quite um, awakened now. I am. Okay. I'm right in. I'm right in line with the times. Okay, perfect. So for for the for for the people who don't know Chris Carpenter, um, Chris Carpenter is the winemaker of um, yeah the Jackson Jackson wines. Family. Jackson family wines. Jackson family wines. Uh, we had uh, in the previous episode. I had a. We had the interview with Barbara Banky, the owner, and now we have the man behind. Um, yeah, who's responsible for the winemaking actually? So it's well, for for four distinct wines in the uh, portfolio of wines. Okay. Well, it would be Cardinal, right? Yeah. And the La Coria range also? Cardinal, La Coria, La Jota, and Mount Brave. Okay, but uh, before we. Try to yeah, let's say um, start to taste the wines. Um, can you tell something about you personally? I, I heard about that you are you used to be a bartender. Yeah, um, I was uh, I was a, a bartender in Chicago. Okay. I uh, had a degree in biology. My my first university stint was in biology, and I enjoyed the restaurant scene. I enjoyed. Um, the wine in general, being a restaurant person and, and, and being somebody who had friends that were working at other restaurants and discovering wine through them. I wanted to do something with my degree. I wanted to do something creative and I wanted to do something that kept me connected to uh, the restaurant scene. And uh, winemaking was the answer to all of that for me. Uh, it, 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 I use the sciences and many different fields of science every yeah, day. Of course, yeah. Uh, I'm the, the wine is symbiotically tied to uh, uh, the restaurants, and I'm in I'm in the kitchens, I'm in the back rooms, I'm in the cellars of restaurants, which are the really cool places to be. Um, I was kind of I was over at the uh, cathedral today, and I was thinking how great it would be to get behind the scenes of that massive cathedral. It's the same thing in the restaurants. You yeah, I'm behind the scenes all the time. And, uh, and I do something very creative. You know, I use my analytical side, but then there's a good portion of my year that, that has to think with the right brain and, and understand nuances of flavor and how those flavors uh, interact with one another and how they'll develop over time. And that, that stirs a different part of my mind. And okay. So um, and how did you um, yeah, get the job uh, by uh, working for, for Jackson Wines. I mean, what were the steps before? Yeah, so I was working in Italy okay. uh, at the Antonori uh, estate in Tuscany, which at the time was called Santa Cristina, oh, okay. which is now called the Tianello estate. They changed the name in the interim. Um, Tianello being a much more uh, prestigious wine than the Santa Cristina wines were. Yeah, we had with Piero Antinori, we had also previous tasting with Piero Antinori on, on this tenuta. It's quite amazing. Uh, it is quite amazing. Yeah. And he's quite a man and quite a legend. Um, so which year was it? That was 97. So I was there for a particularly good vintage as well. Okay, wow. And um, Good vintage. Yeah, it was, it was great. And, and somewhere in my cellar I have a couple of those bottles <laughs> that we made. Uh, but uh, I came back because I had to finish, came back to the United States because I had to finish my thesis and I had to uh, find a job because up until that point my darling wife Tina had been uh, the major breadwinner putting me through school and she wanted to have babies and all that fun stuff. Uh, so I came back and um, started working on my thesis and uh, there was a uh, job fair at uh, the University of California, Davis, and I, um, I approached the table that was representing uh, some of the wines that I was interested in. It was the Jackson Enterprises table. Uh, and I gave uh, the gentleman a resume across the table, or a CV, and I said, listen, I'd like you to pass this to uh, one of your uh, winemakers there. His name is Marco DiGiulio, and he's making wines, uh, he's making Italian variety wines. He's also making a really high and Cabernet. And um, because I had just got back from Italy, I had a full range of experience with some Italian varieties. What I did in Italy was I, I worked in the cellar at, during that harvest, but I also ran one of their experiments. And the experiment was looking at varieties of grape that weren't 
particularly endemic to uh, Tuscany. So we made Grenache, Mouved, Syrah, uh, Tanat, uh, Nero Davila, uh, and, and you had to find out the, the right. Right. They were trying to figure out if they wanted to plant them. Yeah. And then I worked with 12 other varieties of, of Sangiovese. I, this was a time in California when Italian varieties were being looked at as the next big thing. Yeah. It never happened because we screwed that one up really bad because yeah. we started, we tried to make Sangiovese like Cabernet and it shouldn't be made that way. But at this time, it was still going on. So the guy takes my resume and he reads it over and he goes, so you want to see Marco De Giulio, huh? And I said, yeah. He goes, I'm Marco De Giulio. I'm like, oh, wow. And he's like, you made Toraldigo. And I said, yeah, I made Toraldigo. He goes, I just made Toraldigo for the first time. And Toraldigo, as you know, is a variety from Trentino that's typically made as a novello. Yeah. But there was, there's a woman in um, Trentino, I can't remember Elisabetta her Elisabetta first... Voradori. Yes. She's great. I did an interview with her in the previous yeah, video. Check out the archive. She's great. She's great, and she makes fantastic wine. Yeah, and of she course, does, She did something with Toraldigo that people hadn't done. She made it as a wine that was aged in the cellar rather yeah. than as a novello. Yeah. And so Marco had been trying that, and the Antonori's were trying that at the same time. And so he, he's like, he comes from behind the table and he starts talking to me about Toraldigo. And I, I, um, I was, you know, we had this chat and he said, listen, come by the winery and we'll, uh, I, have, I have an opportunity for you. And that's how it, it happened. And I walked into his, into his office like a couple days after this uh, first encounter. And behind his desk, he had a big poster of John Coltrane. Okay, and I said, wow. you're a Coltrane fan? He goes, yeah. yeah. I, go, I just bought a Love Supreme. Okay. And we started talking about Coltrane, and um, it rolled into uh, finally a, a job with them. And uh, it was all those things that I've been looking for. So two men addicted to music, Yo, finding God, each yeah. other. Yep. Great. Yep. Yeah, great story. Just to, to um, for me personally, because uh, you, you mentioned Mr. DiGiulio, mm -hmm. right? Who is he? Because, you know, I'm sorry, I'm quite young. I uh, have to so, know. So Marco De Giulio. He's a legend or what? He, he, he's a legend. Um, and I, I, he's, uh, he's, he was one of my mentors. Okay. Uh, he was one of the gentlemen that made La Coya after the, the original winemaker for La Coya passed away okay. uh, a, a year after starting it. He was, he was working for a gentleman named Greg Upton. Greg uh, got lymphoma, uh, passed away, and Marco took over the, the brand La Coya. Marco was also very much involved in this resurgence of Italian varieties in, in California. He's since moved on, and he's, he's involved with a group of of wines that's um, developing other wine ideas in, in our industry. Um, and, he's, uh, and he has his own brands and he has a couple of clients on the side as well. Okay. Yeah, let me know, uh, what, what is your, um, in your opinion, what, what is so, yeah, how would you describe the, um, the, the Napa region, the Napa Valley, what is so um, distinctive about yeah, this yeah, particular yeah, famous I think what wine set, I think what sets Napa apart um, is the climate uh, and, and the variances in the climate uh, across the valley and, and in, in fact in its place in Napa Valley or in uh, California. You know, in many places in the world, when you ask what distinguishes those places from others, they'll they'll concentrate on the soils. Yeah. If you ask the Bordelais, what why does Bordeaux do so well? They'll talk a lot about the soil types and and the variances between Santa Maria and San Julian. Um, you go to South Africa, that's all they talk about are the soils. In Napa, soils are really important, but what's equally important and sometimes more important is the variability in the, in the uh, temperature and the climate that happens as a result of our position in Napa relative to the very large, enormous valley, the San Joaquin Valley, okay. in the middle of California, and that's effect on the, on the air that comes off of the ocean and the San Francisco Bay, and how those, those things kind of collide in the Napa Valley and create really unique and distinct uh, differences across the valley. For example, I could be in, uh, in in the course of a day, I could be in Napa and the, the temperature is, and, and you'll have to excuse me because I don't think in Celsius, I think in Fahrenheit, uh, but I'll try to speak in Celsius. The temperature down in Napa could be 35 Celsius and up in Calistoga could be 40. 
Okay. You know, there's that much variability. Yeah. And then there are little nooks and crannies all along the valley that ca capture pockets of cold air and, and hold it for a little bit longer. All of those things drive different processes in the grape that create differences in what we perceive on our palate. And why we've split up the valley into all of these different sub-appellations that I kind of specialize in. In particular, the, the specialty of what happens in the mountains, which then creates a whole other uh, um, idea of this variability uh, when you're making wines from mountain grapes. So the first wine is um, yeah, from La Jota. La Jota. La Jota. La Jota Vineyard. It's La Jota. La Jota Vineyard. It's the 2005 um, yeah, Cabernet Franc, whole mountain. And yeah, can you say something about La Jota? I mean... Uh, so La Jota is a very famous vineyard on... Um, it was one of the very first uh, vineyards that was planted up there. Uh, it was planted in uh, 1889. It ran continuously for um, for several decades until American Prohibition, okay. and and then it then it had to shut down. And it, and it remained fallow till the <clears throat> excuse me till the uh, late 70s. And then a, a gentleman named Bill Smith came in and uh, restarted it just about the same time that Randy Dunn was starting his project up there. And uh, it was one of the very, probably considered one of the very first cult wines uh, in Napa Valley. Yeah, the, one of the oldest Appalachian also, right? And one of the older Appalachians. Uh, okay. But back in, in the 1800s, they didn't have the Appalachian. And it's a really cool story. It's a, it's a typical American story when it was started. Um, the... the uh, Land was originally owned by the, um, the Wapo Indian. Uh, the Spanish came up in, in the form of the, the, of the Mexican uh, government, and uh, a gentleman named uh, General Vallejo owned it. The Bear Flag Revolt happened. Uh, which was when California became a republic. Uh, there was, you know, some changes that uh, the general was forced to sell a, a number of uh, his parcels. He owned an enormous amount of la land in California. He sold it to a guy named George Yont, who later was immortalized by having the town of Yontville named after him, and uh, Thomas Keller opened up the French Laundry in that town, and all the rest is history. Okay. Um, George ran it as a cattle ranch uh, and a horse uh, ranch for a while, and then sold it to a guy named Frederick Hess, who was a Swiss German who had immigrated to um, the United States. He probably had the winery built, and we still have the winery up there that was built originally by Frederick Hess, uh, by an Italian uh, who was one of the main uh, masons in Napa Valley. It was he probably oversaw a bunch of Chinese workers that were working in the silver mine, the quicksilver mines with mercury yeah. uh, around Napa Valley. Uh, that, that actually put the stones together. It's been continuously farmed mostly by Mexicans, and um, it's just one of these places that has all of this great history, this frontier history, and, and we're still making wine out of it. Uh, and it's a fantastic Appalachian. Uh, just, just a wonderful place to make grapes. It's probably, the Howe Mountain Appalachian in general is probably the closest that we have to Bordeaux in Napa Valley as far as the climate and I the terroir. So, yeah. mm -hmm. This particular uh, vineyard was planted, it's one of the older Cab Franc vineyards in Napa Valley. It was planted in 78. It's the, one of the few that survived from Bill Smith's original planting. We only get about a ton and a half an acre out of this, um, out of this. so it's very small. That's yeah. like a little over three tons a hectare of production. It's not that much grape. But these, these vines, old vines, tend to balance fruit production perfectly, and they tend to create flavors on their own that we don't have to affect as farmers. It's, it's, yeah. We just gotta make sure that they have enough water to, to, to make protect it. protect them, right? Yeah, okay. yeah. And they do, they do fairly well. And this is from that, that old vine. We only make about 200 cases of this a year, uh, 12 bottle cases, so not a, lot of, not a lot of wine is produced from this, uh, from this vineyard. And there's very few uh, Cab Francs in the Napa Valley that are just bottled as Cab Yeah, and so it's 100% Cabernet Franc? Yep. Okay. Okay, yeah. great. So uh, yeah, let's taste the wine. Well, the, the color, we, I, I opened the bottle one hour ago. It was, um, um, yeah, 
first impression a little bit closed, but mm -hmm. now the second impression, wow. It's open. Wow. And, and most of my wines are like that, Piero, yeah. because the tannins uh, from these mountain vineyards tend to, tend to you know, they're, they're protecting the, the flavor compounds. And in order for you to get at the flavor, they need a little oxygen. Even the older wines, like the O5s, and that oxygen helps to bind some of that tannin up and releases some of the flavor compounds. Yeah. And so whenever you drink mountain wines from Napa, in general, it doesn't just have to be my wine. Yeah, yeah. It's a really, really good idea to give them a little oxygen for a while and let them and let the let the flavor come out. And let yeah, I think many, many many people do the mistake. They open the bottle and say, "Oh, come on, oh, well, I paid so much for this bottle," and then it's closed. But I'm, I think patient would be a good yeah. Yeah, attitude. So uh, that's a typical American thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah um, uh, Americans, though they like really young wines, they're very impatient sometimes. <laughs> so you have to you have to really coach them that audience on how to approach these wines. And most of the collectors that we deal with are are pretty good about that. Yeah, yeah. I know. Okay, so um, yeah, let's sniff the wine. I mean, um, or before we sniff the color, it's like uh, it's a little bit um, yeah, it's a nice transparency. It's not that. Dark huge color, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, well, the nose absolutely um, open, absolutely fragrant. It's like um, packed with many spices. Yeah. We have still the the fruit here, a great uh, yeah. let's say uh, blackberry fruit. And quite elegant. It's not that super dark chocolate blockbuster. No, really you wouldn't expect that from yeah. Cab Franc. Yeah. You know. Cab Franc, you want that? I mean, I'm getting a lot of that that uh, candied um, candied fruit character yeah. on this, which is a, which is a real typical uh, characteristic of Cab Franc. Wow! I'm really happy with how the fruit's developing in this wine. This is almost a, a ten year old wine, and there's still a tremendous amount of fruit. Yeah. Great, wow. And also, man, this is really, before I tasted it before, it was like also close on the palate, but now yeah. it's absolutely an explosion. It's really, um, yeah, it has many, it's a lot of grip. It's like. Uh, and it'll continue to change. Over yeah. the next couple of hours, it'll continue to develop. A really, uh, it's, 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 a, it's a beautiful palate. It's gorgeous wine. It's like uh, the tannins are, um, yeah, they are. Yeah, supple, I would say. Yeah. yeah, still some a little bit, also some um, yeah, some fine grain tannins also, mm -hmm. but but somehow also t supple. Uh, great acidity, and uh, absolutely the, the spice and the, the spice you have on the palate is, is, is great wine. Well, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate. It. Wow. Well, it's really. I think it's the the, the potential is still um, yeah has an aging potential. Oh yeah. Think, for yeah. Let's say. I don't know. Well, you're, it, this is what nine years old now. Am I doing my math right? No, it's eight years old. Sorry, I'm actually pretty good at math. But um, the you know that this is an eight-year-old wine, and this, this still got a lot of tannins, still has a lot of fruit. It's probably got another good ten years uh, of of carrying that fruit, and then it'll have then it'll you know go over, but it'll be that you know the age character, and that's where you really got to kind of dial in your personal likes and dislikes with wine. You know, some people want the fruit the whole way through. Other people really kind of like those age characters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and uh, these wines will last a long time. Those tannins, those mountain tannins, help preserve our wines quite a long time. Okay, so uh, once again, uh, compliments for this wine is really a complex wine with many layers and absolutely, uh, yeah, I like the grip. Uh, it's really great. So the next wine is the Mont Brave. Uh, is the name of the winery also, or what is it? Is, is it the brand? Because um, it's, it's it's the brand, the vineyard, and the winery. Okay, so it's uh, yeah, Mount Brave, two o nine, and um, yeah, I'm quite curious because I tasted it before a little bit. Uh, it was yeah directly. Thank you. Open. Uh, so do you vinify the, the wines in, in in different wineries, or how did I? Yes, I do. I, I do and I don't. Um, La Hoda is made completely at the La Hoda Winery. There's okay. a the very small winery that I mentioned uh, up on Howe Mountain. 
Uh, Mount Brave, uh, Cardinal La Coya are all made at Cardinal right now. Uh, we're, we're planning on developing a, another winery for one of the other to either move Mount Brave up okay. uh, to Mount Veter where it's where its uh, home is, or uh, another winery for La Coya. We just haven't gotten there yet. Okay. So are you Which would be fantastic yeah. uh, to have its own home. It, it'd be a pain in the butt for me to run around the Napa Valley even more than I do now. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, such as it is, it, it, one way or another it'll work out. But just because I've never been to, to Napa Valley, it's like, uh, what is about the, the, um, the distance? between the valleys or the, the, the appellation? Well, so it's, it's, it's about 60 square kilometers or uh, miles. So 60 square miles is probably about, I don't know, 80, 90 square kilometers. Okay. Um, and, but that's only the valley floor. Yeah. What you forget is that most of my wine is in the mountains. So I'm up and down mountains all day long, and that takes quite a bit of time. If, if I'm up on Hall Mountain and then I have to, get to the other side of the valley on Mount Veter, I'm, I'm driving down the mountainside, then get crossing the valley, then going back up the mountain. Yeah. It, it can take a little while. It can, I suppose it's a, you have a really comfortable car, right? I, <laughs> I, I, I drive a, a beat up old pickup truck up and down the mountains, but okay. I, I, um, I'm comfortable in driving those kind of roads at this point. Okay, so let's head to the wine. Um, yeah, this is, uh, what, what's the difference between, um, yeah, this is a Mount Brave, Napa Valley, so the grapes that came from, from the whole Napa Valley? No, no? So, this, so Mount Brave um, is on the, Nap, the Mount Veter Appalachian. Okay. Uh, we have a, a, a piece of property up there, about 120 acres, so that's about, um, what is that? That's about 60-ish, uh, or probably 70 hectares of land. And um, we grow mostly Cabernet. We have a little bit of Merlot, a little bit of Malbec. We, we originally had only 60 acres, and we acquired another 60 acres in 2007, right next door to the original piece. What we realized was that that second piece had a very different characteristic of flavor than the first piece. And we're going to taste wines from the first piece when we taste the La Coya, the Mount Veter La Coya yeah. is from the original piece. La Coya tends to be a, a wine that you have to age for a very long time. It has very big tannins. It's, uh, it's not a wine that... Um, is perfect for restaurant service because, you know, again, impatience and you want to have your dinner and you want to drink your wine. With La Coya, you have to wait a couple of hours for the wines to really open up. So when we acquired the second property, we realized that we had a wine here that had a lot of the Mount Veter characteristics, mm -hmm. but it was much more approachable earlier on. And you even mentioned that when yeah. you talked about it when you opened the bottle earlier today. It's meant to be that kind of approachable concept uh, so that if you go to a restaurant and you want a Mount Veter wine with all that blue fruit and violets and the blackberry and that and the minerality and the and that and that breadth that it's there but in a, in a much more approachable sense this wine actually has a little bit of Cabernet Franc in it uh, three percent Cabernet Franc and two percent Merlot so it's also a little bit of, of a blend okay yeah but not too much right no no okay. just to kind of spice it up a little bit okay well, the color, it's, of course, it's like, uh, you see it here, it's like, yeah, it's ob obviously darker than the La Jota, Jota. Yeah, great nose, yeah? It's, the fruit is absolutely in up front, yep. um, uh, up front. It's like really, it's, it's a dense fruit, it's, it's, it's a dark fruit, but um, yeah, picked with spices, yeah, great. And so under Mont Brave, I also make uh, two other wines. We make a Merlot and a Malbec. Well, this one is like, wow, it's really round, really juicy, mm -hmm. really approachable. Huh? It's like um, absolutely, yeah, let's say, it's like juice, like a sanguine, yeah. squeezing. And, th and that's the idea. Yeah. I, I wanted a wine that, um, you know, was was something that people could really enjoy with their dinner that supported food uh, rather than than you know out distance food as far as what you what you were thinking about approachable wise okay and what do you think this kind of wine so for for aging you would say it's like 10 years or 
What do you say? Yeah, 10 to 15 is my kind of time frame for this. What you have to remember, and I keep coming back to this, is the tannins in these wines, there are some that you perceive right away. Um, when you first opened the Cab Franc from La Hoda, those those tannins that were that were keeping that wine from developing, you perceive those right away. But there's a lot of tannin that play a background role that help these wines to age for a very long time. And we'll see that when we taste Cardinal coming mm. up. That there you can have a wine that can age for a very long time as well as be approachable earlier on. And I'm hoping Mount Brave is that wine. We only just released the first release of Mount Brave in 2008. So you're tasting the second release oh, of this okay. wine. Perfect. But in my in my head and with my palate knowledge, it's, it's a 10 to 15 year wine. Okay. Well, uh, can I add, once again, compliments. Thank you. So the next wine is um, Cardinal 06, which we had in the previous episode with, uh, yeah, with, um, how do you say? Barbara. With Barbara. You, you, you call, don't call her your chief? No, you call her Barbara, right? Yeah, is I don't know what, what she chief? would do if I called her chief. chief. Wow. Uh, and in Germany, you know, they have the expression, like, they call that the chief is the chief. Oh, uh, yeah. Okay, here we go. Thank you. So Cardinal, um, just to remember my audience, Cardinal is like is the estate. It's in, uh, based in Oakville, right? So, it, so Cardinal, the estate, the winery is in Oakville, but the fruit for this wine came from a number of different appellations in Napa Valley. Uh, Howl Mountain, Mount Veter, uh, Spring Mountain, uh, the Tokelon Vineyard in Oakville, uh, the uh, Clem Carinelli Vineyard in St. Helena, and a little bit from uh, Stagsley. Okay. So the idea with Cardinal is that you take all of these different appellations, and each one has a very specific characteristic, and you layer them. And it, it's very analogous to, um, to, well, to your kids. You know, we were talking about your kids. You know, your kids have now, are they Italian, they're German, and they're Turks. Yeah. And they've got all these great parts of their of their heritage now that have blended into making them who they are. Yeah. And and you probably see pieces of the Italian heritage in your kids and, and, and your wife's Turkish heritage and the German and when the, she's playing soccer, maybe. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> okay. Uh, and 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 you can pick that that piece out, yeah. but in the same breath, they are who they are, and you just love them because they're they're your kids, and they're that one yeah. individual. Yeah. Cardinal is that same thing. It's it's you can pick out the the Tokelon, or you can pick out the Mount Veter, or the Howl Mountain, and each has a place in in that wine, but. Uh, overall, it's one wine, and you're just supposed to enjoy it for what it is. So there's only one wine, one Grand Vin. You don't produce a second wine. No, nope, no, nope. just okay. we just have one. I had, my assistant winemaker Laura Diaz, who someday you should interview because she's fantastic. Yeah, I read uh, about her. Really uh, talented uh, she, Spanish. Yes, yep, she's a very talented Spanish uh, winemaker. She makes a companion Sauvignon Blanc to this wine, but as far as other red wines, no, Cardinal is all by itself. Okay. Great. Well, um, yeah, let's taste the wine. It's like really, the color is really huge. How do you say it in, in, in American? It's like a dark, huge color, right? Dark, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Dark, huge. Ah, well, it's really a uh, poo. And um, I mean, yeah, well, it was really emotional the, with Barbara Banky, the uh, Banky, when we tasted the color mm -hmm. of six because the wine was really a kind of explosion. Oh, I'm glad. We, well. So now. Yeah, and it still is, huh? <clears throat> wow. I like, I like the spice. It's more, more, more spicy than the other wines for me. It's my impression. There's, a, there's a lot more layers in, in Cardinal. Um, not that the other wines are not complex, but, you know, with Cardinal, I'm bringing in all of these different components. Okay. I usually will sit down with, like I said, 30 to 50 wines to make this one wine, and each one of those wines is adding some layer of complexity or filling some gap in the overall uh, yeah. flavor uh, spectrum to, to increase what you're being uh, um, stimulated by from a flavor perspective. Yeah, wow. What? Yeah. Let's taste wine. Well, great. Mm. Wow. It's really, it's like, um, 
You're doing quite a good job there. Oh, thank you. Yeah. I hope so. No, it's really, it's, the wine is like um, <clears throat> expanding. It's like really, uh, you have it on the palate, it's first soft and it's getting, yeah, the tenants make them change to wines a little bit. They make it like this fi fine quality grained uh, tenants also, uh, which, which adds a lot of complexity to the wines. Nice acidity, really balanced and um, the fruit is dense to the core also. Yeah. But you have still, what I like, I really appreciate is the, the elegance in the wines. It's not like they're only like like chewy, you know, yeah, like, yeah, like yeah. the blockbuster yeah. thing. It's really um, they have a really elegant touch. Well, you name you you nailed the word that we think of when when you know within my team of people that work with Cardinal is elegance. We really want to go for elegance with this wine. Yeah. You know, we have the powerhouse in La Coya. So you got power with La Coya, and we have elegance with Cardinal, and it helps to separate them and, and make it more interesting for the people that like to explore the wines that but, I produce. But this is also due to the fact that the that you that grapes come from higher yeah vineyards. Yeah? Well, I, it's the, it has a lot to do with that. You know, from the mountain vineyards, it has a lot to do with the fact that we're blending them, and yeah. and it, it it's also about how I approach this wine and how I think about it. Um, I want to produce an elegant wine. I want to produce a, a very complex wine. You know, the native yeast helped to complex the wine out because you have different yeasts creating different flavors from the raw product. You know, we have two or three different yeast species probably uh, affecting these wines. The, the number of different uh, appellations and, and uh, vineyard blocks that go into this, each with their own category, helps to complex it and make it a little more elegant. The addition of the Merlot, uh, the egg white fining, uh, everything, every step of the way is meant to you know, capture that and to, and to produce a wine that um, you know, is, is about the, the whole breadth of the Napa Valley for that vintage and defining that vintage and, and, and defining it in, in an elegant way. Well, um, I'm really curious about uh, well the, the next wine, um, which will be from uh, Locoya, from the Locoya estate, will be yeah. the Mont Vida Cabernet yeah. Sauvignon, uh, which is um, yeah not not a single vineyard, but is what the grapes are only from yeah this appellation, right? So so Locoya takes it, it, if Cardinal is this is this blend of all of these different um, uh, wines and and kind of getting a, a sense of the Napa Valley in in total and how it works during that vintage. La Coya is, is an exploration of each appellation and how it, how it shows itself via the lens of Cabernet uh, without the effect of a winemaker. So it's about the place, it's not about the winemaking. And I try to keep the winemaking pretty identical in each one of those wines so that when you taste the four of them, Diamond, Spring, Hall, and Viter, what you taste is the place and you can actually explore the, the idea of Cabernet in each one of those relative to one another. Okay, well, great, then um, yeah, let's, let's head to the next wine. Great, thank you. So the next wine is the 05 Cabernet Franc from Mount Vida, um, La Coya Estate, and... Um, Cabernet Sauvignon. Did you say Cabernet Franc? You said Cabernet Franc. Accidenti, I mean Cabernet, yeah, okay, Cabernet Sauvignon. Um, well, Mount Vida, it's like the, it's the highest appellation, right? Or is it... Uh, I don't, you know, that's a really good question, Piero. I don't, I, I've never been asked that question. Well, Barbara, I, I talked in, in, in the previous episode, she talked about the dark juice. Was it on Mount Vida or on Whole Mountain? They talk, she was probably talking about Whole Mountain. Whole she, Mountain, okay. I don't, I don't recall. Okay. Well, this is, yeah, this is a great wine, huh? Yeah. Wow. But this is some, um, quite from the fruit, it's matured, it's 05, yeah? Mm -hmm. Wow, but you still need time, like you said. Yeah? Yeah. It's um, also a little bit close, but I think... Um, so look, the Mount Vida Lacoyas, we typically open these two or three hours ahead of time before tasting them. Wow. Well, so so it's, it's one of these, it, there's a, a massive amount of tannins that are concentrated in these wines. This is a great appellation. And it's and it it's great because it's one of the very first appellations in the morning that gets the sunlight without being hot. Yeah. So that sun creates flavor compound changes without you know, the, just the the 
beaming of the sun cha changes the energy state of these flavor compounds and develops them. Heat, which you don't see for a couple hours after the sun comes up, changes the tannins and the, um, and the uh, uh, sugar. So we get this great concentration of flavor, which, you, which you're seeing in this. But the tannins, you know, we don't, those don't start developing till nine in the morning. What happens in the afternoon is Vita is one of the first appellations in the afternoon that cools down. So it stops like, that tannin development well, later in the, or earlier in the afternoon than, for, for example, Diamond Mountain, which is up towards Calistoga, which is another Lacoya that we make. Yeah. So you get this you get this great concentration of flavor, but then your tannins don't develop as well in the vineyard as they do in other places. But the tannins are really like they're yummy, chewy kind of tannins. Um, so the La Coya Vita is a wine that you know carries fruit for 20, 25 years easily uh, because those tannins are preserving the fruit characters. But you have to remember that when if you're opening it two years after. You know, it's been released because you're going to get a, a fistful of tannin okay. uh, when you first taste it, unless you are patient and you can you can let it uh, decant for a few hours. Yeah, words from a winemaker. Yeah, listen to this. Yeah, I mean it's like it's like the way it is. Yeah, it's like um, absolutely agree. So I make. Wow. I, I make four of these. I don't know if uh, Bar did Barbara talked to you about that a little yeah, bit. Yeah, we we tasted the uh, uh, diamond uh, diamond uh, spring spring Howl mountain and Vida. and Vida, yeah. yeah, okay. So this one is like, um, well, the color is like, yeah, it's a nice, it's, it's a dark hued color. The nose is, um, yeah, it's like, but you get so much blackberries. Wow, oh, this is great, yeah. It's my, you can, yeah, it's a hint of elegance. It's really a proof. That's yeah, so even open up. Wow, that, I really love the wines. They have some, they have all this special grip, you know, some, so they're lively there. It's not like boring stuff. It's like really, um, I like the expression in the wines. Mm -hmm. Um, com um, compared with, with, with the fruit and, and, and acidity, the tannins are really high quality tannins. They are high quality tannins. Yeah, really. But you feel it on, on the whole palate, and when you swallow it down, it's like really like um, yeah, so much expression. Great wines. Thank you. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Thanks a lot for being here on my show, on the wine show. Uh, Chris, um, appreciate it. Thank you once again. Have a good trip here in Europe. Uh, where are you heading to these days? Uh, next is Copenhagen. Copenhagen. And then London. Okay. And then I have a stint in New York. And then okay. I'm, then I'm home. Okay, home sweet home. home well, sweet home. once again, uh, yeah, wish you the best for the future, for 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 the projects, for your family, of course. And Thank you. Uh, yeah, I hope I see you. Yeah, someday back here in the wine show, or maybe well, I hope in the you, Napa. I see you in Napa. Yeah, I hope so too. Actually, okay. So, uh, well, this was the interview with Chris Carpenter from the Napa Valley, and uh, well, I really hope that you enjoyed the yeah the, the talking. And uh, well, one love, and see you in the next video.